question. I don't think that at, at college, at university, one is taught to a, be entrepreneurial, to enjoy it. Um, we're terribly bogged down in what we do, uh, and that may mean bogged down in only thinking the whole world's about design. Business of Architecture UK, episode two. Hello and welcome Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the award-winning platform that combines time and expense tracking, billing, project management, accounting, and business intelligence. Make work easy with Core. You can get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.co.uk forward slash demo. Today, I'm interviewing Chris Roman Lee, who is one half of the founding directors of Studio Octopi, a London-based architectural design-led practice whose work covers many sectors from arts, schools, leisure, commercial, and of course, much private residential work. And in this interview, it's a real privilege to talk to Chris about a real passion project of his, which he's spoken about on TED Talks before, which is for the Thames Bath, which was basically a project that was born out of uh, Chris sort of swimming in Lake Zurich. And they really became interested in how to reinvigorate and reuse and increase access to lots of London's underused urban waterways and how to make a recreational use for the River Thames. So in this interview, Chris goes into a lot of depth about the story behind that project, how they've been finding publicity, how they got publicity, how the project was born, and how they've been looking for investment and the stages that they're at in making this project become real. So an absolute brilliant story. I hope you do enjoy. Thank you. Welcome. This is Ryan Willard with the Business of Architecture. I'm here with Chris Roma Lee. Hi, Chris. Hello there, Ryan. Who is the co-founder of Studio Octopi. That's correct. And you nice. guys got founded in 20, 2003. Three, 2003, yep. Excellent. And you've been specialising on... <laughs> You've been specialising, <laughs> we've got a lot of cheering in the back. <laughs> as soon as we start recording. Um, you guys do a lot of residential work, commercial um, and public buildings. Yes, yeah, we've, we've managed to cross a lot of sectors um, over the last uh, eight to ten years. Um, starting off in residential, moving into um, doing theatres, uh, arts buildings, commercial fit out um, and then water. Yes, the, 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 the Thames Bath project. Yes, yeah, that's kind of uh, taken our time up for the last uh, four years, probably too long. Um, but we inch closer to a pool in the Thames. Hmm. So how did you how did you begin? Um, we started off uh, with um, the desire to uh, run a small practice better than the practices we'd been working uh, at, um, which uh, I don't think we've managed to achieve, but we have managed to uh, <laughs> establish a practice and keep it going. So that's point one done. Um, now I realise quite how hard it is to uh, to run a practice. Um, so it's not not quite as easy as just doing it better than anyone else. Um, and uh, we started off with one project and it was a kitchen extension, usual stuff, um, which uh, within three months of starting uh, that job, quitting my other job, uh, we, f- we promptly lost the job because uh, the client told us that the table which she hadn't yet bought didn't fit in the extension that we hadn't yet built. Um, which yeah still puzzles me to the day, uh, so that was a that was a good interesting start. Luckily, we managed to pick up. Um, a, yeah, it was kind of a wake up call. You realise the shit you're about to get into, and yeah. I was like, oh yeah, great. Um, but anyway, we picked up a whole series of uh, smaller projects, um, and uh, started off down this journey as Octopi, as a, a, a many-handed beast um, working in different sectors, which I think was probably our, our mission from day one, right. that we really liked the idea that we were going to be working in different sectors, uh, even though probably for the first seven, six, seven years, it was pretty much purely residential. Um, yeah, and then, a, and then a big break came when one of our residential clients, who, who's now a good friend, said, do you fancy looking at my office? I work at Saatchi and Saatchi. 
Uh, and I said, yeah, I can be there probably in about half an hour. Does that suit? Excellent. And he was like, yeah, uh, you just, just calm down a bit. We, we need you to pitch for it. So we did a uh, ridiculous proposal for a, a sort of red organic piece of, well, for want of a better term, snot passing <laughs> through the, the reception in Charlotte Street. <laughs> and uh, we got in through the door to present it. And they said, you basically, you've got the job on one condition that we don't build what you've drawn. Uh, again, <laughs> another wake up call. <laughs> Um, but that, that was a turning point. Um, and then we had a succession of, of commercial fit out jobs on the back of that, all for ad agencies, interestingly. Right. Okay. So you kind of developed a niche unexpectedly. An unexpected niche, yeah. Um, and what, and we, what, what, would you, what would you say was the sort of the key to like, those first initial clients and kind of growing the practice? Um, to hang on to them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> make sure you chose the right uh, kitchen sink and tap. Um, I think we, we approached it from a uh, point of view of um, being very obsessed by the details, right? Uh, which luckily the clients that we had um, uh, allowed us to do that mm. um, and spend a lot of time resolving seemingly the most irrelevant detail in the job. Um, and I think that set us uh, set us aside from, from others, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and I think ultimately clients like that to know that they've got a real first... Uh, first hand well, it wasn't quite the right word but a uh, real uh, bespoke service yeah coming in uh, dealing directly with the directors um, and to a certain extent we still do that now yeah uh, James or myself will work on every job that comes in will be the point of contact mm. um, and it's an, a degree of control freakery I suppose <laughs> uh, but uh, but it allows us it's what we enjoy doing I, yeah. I don't mind doing the everyday stuff as well as the high level stuff so you're still involved in the, with the drawing and the drafting and yeah, detailing yeah. and every clients other. ultimately you know they, they do like dealing with the directors um, that said you know we've had over the years a succession of excellent people working for us all mm. of which um, we've given uh, increasing amounts of responsibility to them, uh, to them to run jobs and, and look after them so we don't pretend by any means that we do it all but um, they do they do like that sort of kind of hands-on approach yeah and so what was the the, the Thames Bath project can you t talk a little bit about so that so the Thames Bath project started off in uh, four years ago now uh, 2013 the end of 2013 with an open call um, it was late summer and it was an open call by the Royal Academy the Architecture Foundation and uh, Rogers Sturk Harbour okay. for um, it was aligned with the Rogers exhibition at the Royal Academy for his 80th exactly yeah. and it asked for future ideas for the Thames I think it was future ideas for the river banks of the Thames actually got it um, and at the time I was having a late summer holiday with my family swimming in Lake Zurich um, and we had literally it was one of those very strange moments we'd literally just walk from the city centre to the lake mm. to have a swim before going back to where we were staying and the kids were mucking around in the lake and a tweet came up from the Architecture Foundation going why don't you join in with this um, you know dr drumming up support uh, and I literally looked up and thought swimming in the middle of a city in the in the city waters uh, why don't people swim in the Thames I mean, yeah. at that point it seemed incredibly obvious and I was like I can't believe no one's done this before <laughs> <laughs> uh, got back to London did a load of research realised obviously that Copenhagen had kicked all that uh, kicked that off with the, the beautiful baths in, in the harbour yeah. uh, and then further research tells me that you know pretty much any European city with a decent amount of water has got a floating pool in the river uh, or lake or whatever it is uh, Zurich had had theirs since the 18 mid 1800s right um, and actually London the last one in London was in 1875 which was a cast iron and glass uh, where was that uh, Charing Cross right okay so uh, there's a lovely etching actually in the Houses of Parliament which is where I first saw it when I was giving a talk there for Thames Bath I came across it on the stairs which mm. was really quite bizarre um, and it was enclosed heated filtered uh, swimming pool um, which yeah, lasted about 10 years or so so the precedent has been set yeah uh, and then of course the quality of the Thames deteriorated and uh, we, we know the rest but um, so I came back to London we did the proposal we had a very um, dreamy like a vision of Blackfriars post super sewer when mm. it, it would be safe to swim in the Thames or supposedly safe to swim in the Thames uh, one floating pool one uh, kind of rock pool which would fill up at high tide yeah um, 
and I managed to get it into the evening standard through after the presentation at the Royal Academy that all went well and everyone was patting everyone on the back and there were lots of great other ideas involved and whatever. And w was it was it a project that had uh, like the potential to actually be realized like in when it was a competition stage or when it was the idea stage um, or was it just a kind of speculative No, it was it was purely just a speculative speculative ideas over right. call um suggestion what we drew was um, certainly probably was never going to get built yep. but hey that's the, that's the fun of those kind of competitions yeah. um, so we, I got it into the evening standard um, just by persevering and cornering someone <laughs> uh, but that actually as soon as it went into the evening standard then the whole thing kicked off because we were just receiving emails going when's this happening it seems mad not to have this we must get this sorted amazing um, and uh, yeah so we just started plowing time into developing it and so how did you go about, uh, well, how, what, what, what was the plan from there to sort of make it realize, um, realizable? Obviously, I, I think at, the, at that point we were probably um, uh, just rolling along with the fun uh, and thinking, well, this is quite fun, isn't it? Perhaps mm. we're going to do this. And I seem to remember thinking, oh, I could probably get this tied up within a year. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay, well, if you think you can do it in about a year, that's like, yeah, no problem. There's such a momentum here. Uh, <laughs> so one of the comments which came back was, can we do it before the super, super sewer um, completes? Yeah. Uh, which I think is 2023, 20, 24, or something like that. Um, and I said, uh, yeah, of course we can. We'll, we'll, we'll separate the pool water from the Thames water and we'll use plants around the edge to as reed beds and we'll filter the Thames water and you'll swim in river water, but it'll be clean and safe. Yep. Uh, so you're, you're not uh, affected by the sewer leakages which happen uh, every time it rains um, and so we, we uh, produced another visual uh, and uh, that went similarly uh, bonkers uh, just kind of got everywhere I mean it's almost quite embarrassing now seeing those visuals because uh, I just think people must be sick to death of seeing those, <laughs> those visuals which we've all seen and we've all commented on about by other architects go, God if I see that yeah. image ever again uh, but these these images just kept on going, and we were in the in the uh, newspaper in um, Singapore, in uh, mm. in um, the Wall Street Journal on the, yeah. on the front page of that, uh, just bonkers places which we just never even dreamed. And I thought, well, around, maybe we're onto something here. Um, and that was 2014, I suppose. Yeah. And th did it, did it produce more work? Did did um, you did you it get began like began to get produce inquiries? We had a plethora of of sudden inquiries about mm. people have calling us up from European uh, was it European yeah, some European cities but mainly UK cities going uh, we've got a waterway we'd love to have a pool can you do a proposal for us I was like blimey yeah uh, it's like no one's paying us to do this at the moment we, we selected a few we worked with a couple of developers on initial ideas um, but I think the, the 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 cost of it really only adds up when you go big Right to get the return. Yeah, when it's when it's small. Like it's a very expensive addition to to a waterway. Um, so we d we did a few of those, and then and then we thought, okay, we've got to we've got to raise some capital here, otherwise yeah. we're, we're just going to drag the whole practice down into this <laughs> black hole of pools, which <laughs> everyone wants but no one commissions. Um, <laughs> and so we we held a, a Kickstarter campaign, which we we'd never done before. Right. Um, which was um, an, an, an another extraordinary experience of. Was this so? Was this to raise funds to actually get the con for construction fees? Well, no, or it was for just, well, raise some funds to be able to develop the design develop the into, a, uh, into a realistic option. So, right. uh, in 2015, we started working on that in January, and we went live in May. I think it was. Yeah. So it was about five months of preparing the the um, the copy you see on the website. Yep. Um, lining up some people to to pledge um getting uh actually we tried to stop the press then because we realized that we were just going to use up all our goodwill if we weren't careful which which was actually quite hard because you know when, pe when big people come along and go we want to put it into a magazine or whatever what do you do you go no yeah so um we kept going and then we launched and then within 30 days we'd raised one hundred and forty two thousand pounds uh from uh, mainly Londoners, but also as far away as Australia, the States, um, people who love London, um, people who love swimming, um, just, just amazing goodwill. Not, yeah. a, not a bad person 
said well, no, 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 no one said a bad thing about it um, and it still staggers me that in those 30 days that people were prepared to to put so 140 grand in 30 days yeah this phrase. Uh, and it was Fantastic. a very mental time I mean I didn't yeah. do a stroke of fee earning work I mean arguably I was fee earning but we'd already spent about 100 grand writing the <laughs> yeah the copy for the site so yeah. it was all slightly um, madness uh, and then we um, yeah so it, it concluded and we we'd, we'd exceeded our target we had uh, 10 people who'd given five grand mm -hmm. um, and the majority were 45 50 quid people so we had then we had a series of rewards which we had to send out as as, as uh, so how many people roughly would you say uh, it was contributed? about 1200 people right contributed uh, and a thousand of those qualified for rewards so anything above 45 pounds yeah. or 45 and above got a reward ranging from swim hats of different colors to prints and with, and with that campaign it was largely the, the press coverage that you were getting that was able to kind of sort of have yeah. have an audience yeah. come and find the kick, kickstarter and yeah yeah i think it, it was that because once we'd once we'd launched mm. no one wanted to cover the story yeah up until launch everyone wanted to cover the story right uh so we we realized and uh, you know we pushed it hard in the in the coming weeks to the to the kickoff yeah and got some great stories you mm. know, um uh, some slightly misleading stories that we were uh, raising funds to build the pool. Uh, <laughs> it was th the Times, even, who sort of said, <laughs> you know, we were raising 150000 to build the pool. Yeah. It's like, okay. Uh, so, uh, and there weren't that many people who'd done sort of civic crowdfunding at that stage on that sort of scale. Um, and certainly not necessarily on Kickstarter in the UK anyway. Um, so, yeah. So we had a, we had a, a decent... Uh, lump of cash which we then uh, had to do the rewards and the rewards were a complete nightmare I'm not going to mm. pretend we had to send out a you know, thousand swim hats of the right colour and the right prints uh, we very luckily got Speedo on board who provided the swim hats and the printing of our logo alongside their logo for and nothing the, and the postage <laughs> sadly not the postage but just the coordination if anything it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. necessarily the cost but you know, but because we, we'd yeah, been advised to keep within seven percent of mm. uh, of the uh, of the pledge, um, but just the time involved. Oh my god! Yeah, it was like a you know just a bad joke, really. Wow. Lots of help from volunteers, which was very grateful. But we, uh, <laughs> we never quite, they, you know, understandably they could all do a certain amount of time. Yeah. And then and then leave us, but uh, so we had to finish it off. Mm. And it, what we thought was a couple of hours turned out to be you know another four days of putting stuff into green envelopes wow that's quite epic yeah it was quite an epic journey and then and then so once once you'd kind of got the funds from doing the kickstarter then how did the project begin to did uh, you have like a business model for it or how it was like yeah so ultim we, had, we then had to write a business plan which right. was, was the first business plan we'd ever written we didn't write right. one for studio octopi because uh, we thought we knew what we were doing uh this one we needed a business plan to to prove uh, that it worked yeah um because anyone can you know suggest an idea for 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 anywhere yeah uh, if it doesn't work economically you're just you know wasting your time so uh, our business plan shows that it does work mm. um and then we also developed the water filtration system right for for the baths so um speaking with some uh a german company about um how we can deal with that and the unpredictability of the quality of the water in the thames right um and the engineering with our marine engineers um so now we know how to do it uh or the thing continually evolves. I mean, the business plan evolves, the design evolves, yeah. the design evolves, the business plan evolves. It's so how do you how do you keep track of the sort of the 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 sort of technical costs, the cost of the construction, and then the sort of the revenue of like predicted yeah. revenue? Or how, how do you well, speculate with about? With a great deal of trouble, uh, <laughs> mainly because we're trying to run a practice as well as do all this. Yeah. Um, and yes, we were being paid a certain amount to through the Kickstarter uh, fund to pay us and other consultants mm. to do that. Um, but ultimately, it ne never really covers the cost. I mean, the amount of time we'd put in beforehand so uh, it had already opened up a huge hole of, uh, yeah. of time uh, and money. So um, with a great deal of difficulty keeping, keeping in control of everything. In the office, it was very interesting that James and I fell into playing a... Uh, Different different roles with different hats on. Yeah. So James would always pay Thames Bath architect. I would pay Thames Bath client CEO. Yeah. Uh, and how that panned out was quite interesting, or still is interesting. We still have that. We fall it naturally into that role. Um, so I'm always uh, sort of reviewing his 
his work mm. uh, on, on the design aspect of it and, and how, how we're progressing. Um, but it is a juggling act. Yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's not ideal, but you know, we've made so much headway, we can't, we can't now ditch it. I mean, we, we, we know how this thing can be done. Um, and so what, what, are the next, what are the next steps you're looking for? So the next for? steps, the next steps are we're looking for, for, for seed investment, for further funding, yeah. really. Um, we've got uh, a couple of ideas of where, where we'd like to be. Um, one, one idea is, is Bankside, outside right. uh, Tate Modern, and the other idea is in the, in the docks. Um, both are, are being pursued at the moment alongside many and other. And is it something that the, the local government would fund or um, there would be sort of funds available for that? Possibly. Or? We're in the sort of post-Garden Bridge era. Right. So uh, we know it can be done through private funding, through sponsorship. Yeah. Um, and our business model shows that it can be done through private money. Um, I mean, I think, you know, uh, we are a CIC. The Thames Baths is a CIC. It's a community interest company. So ultimately... Right. We're not another um, fairground a ride for, for, for London. We're not right. another London Eye. Um, this is something for the community, and hopefully the community will run it as well. So what's, what's the CIC? Uh, community Interest Company. So how, how so does it's that... a sort of half charity, half limited company. Right. So it has some of the benefits of being a charity okay. um, without all the bureaucracy, effectively, which charities have to adhere to. Right. So we, uh, the, the funds which go into, into the company are asset-locked for the use as stated in in the company documentation, which right. is uh, increasing access to um, waterways, yep. um, and we can only take out a certain amount of money from the company for for uh, as directors. So it is quite tightly restrained, right. different to um, a limited company, um, and hopefully completely transparent. Because, yep. um, well, I mean, at the moment we're not making any money from it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think anyone's making any money, but hopefully one day. Uh, we'll be in a position to be running one or more mm. um, floating baths uh, of different sizes in the Thames. Amazing. Yeah. Well, that, was, that was quite a vision. Uh, it is quite a vision. Um, and I think uh, it's perfectly achievable. So it's whether it's whether we're lucky enough to deliver it or someone else. But I think yeah. we've made um, enough headway. And uh, a lot of it's just been about changing people's perceptions mm. of, of that dear river out there, which looks particularly brown today. Yes, and it's, murky. it's not beautiful. And, um, <laughs> but actually, the simple things like the color is not because it's poisonous. Yeah. It's, you know, my mother keeps telling me uh, it's poisonous because it's brown. It's like, no, it's not poisonous because it's brown. It's poisonous. <laughs> Sorry, it's poisonous. It's brown because so what, it's so with the silt in it. So, so was that a kind of, um, you know, when you're kind of talking about its market feasibility? Yeah. People kind of that perception of the Thames was that was that kind of a like, lot of like. Um, yeah, I mean that that was one of the biggest biggest issues with it really. And and to be absolutely honest, you know, I was not aware on how clean it actually was until right. you start looking at, at looking at it and all the people who've been working so hard over mm. the years to to improve it. That's why we see dolphins and seals out there. Uh, the big problem is that every time it rains, even as little as two millimeters, can overflow the sewers. And then raw sewage can be seen floating down the Thames, which is why they're building the super sewer, the big drain underneath, yeah. uh, underneath the Thames, which will uh, apparently, you know, resolve 96% of the se current sewage, right. which is leaked into the Thames. So we will have a very different river on our hands when when that ha when that's complete. Yeah. Um, but it's also um, just a very complex river in terms of its tidal reach. You know, six meter tidal change in the centre of town. Um, it, it, it's uh, you know it's affected by the sea. It's got very you know it's very saline as well as yeah. fresh water. Um, it moves very quickly because we've built out into it with bridges and mm. embankments. So the whole thing is a very complex nightmare, really. Right. It's not the same as just building it in a lake. You know, building Thames Bath in a lake. Hey, we'd probably be done by now. Sling out a couple of pontoons and be done with it. Gosh, but here. So, what kind of what kind of lessons have you learnt from doing this project? Like in terms of running a practice and business lessons, and the kind of the the obstacles that you face when trying to raise investment and seed capital. Yeah, I mean, I think. And, um, and how how has it sort of influenced or changed the way that you run a practice? Um, I think it's made us uh, more audacious. Um, Great. Uh, more outgoing. Um, it's made us realise that. Um, you know, if we're going to make this thing happen, yeah, then uh, we've got to step out of the comfort zone. Yeah, uh, there's no point we're, if we sit in the office and wait for the funding to come in. You know, you may as well just put the drawings in the bottom of the drawer and, and forget about it. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, I have, right from day one, well, right from getting it into the evening standard, always just stepped just that little bit outside of the comfort zone in the, and, and testing the waters, like dipping your toes in a cold. What's, what's been the most uncomfortable thing that you've done? Uh, tapping Sadiq Khan on the shoulder <laughs> uh, without thinking about it. Uh, I was standing right next to him in the tube. Oh, I love it. Uh, and I thought, if I actually stop to think about this, I probably won't do it. So I won't even think about it. I'll just tap him on the shoulder. And I tapped him on and I said, hello, Sadiq. And he looked around, quite a short guy, so he looked around at my chest and then <laughs> up at my head and went, you know, like, who are you? Uh, <laughs> luckily, it was day five, so I don't think anyone else knew who he was on the tube yeah. at that point. Uh, and uh, we had a 10-minute chat between Kennington and uh, Clapham, where I get off, and he was going on to um, Tooting. And we had a chat about the baths. He knew about it. He knew we'd been crowdfunding. Right. Uh, we then exchanged letters. And we we already had a contact at GLA, to be honest, from, from when Boris's yep. was in there. And so we've just carried on the conversation. So he's very much aware of the project. He has understandably bigger priorities, mm -hmm. such as housing. Uh, and yeah, we, we keep them up to date with where we're going. Um, you know, Boris did have a plan to do it himself. Soon after we started, he had a, a, a look at um, our ideas and thought, I'll have a bit of that. Um, which uh, we managed to um, keep. Yeah, because it can obviously be quite a sort of political piece mm. of, of built work. Yeah, there was a terrible moment where we thought it was going to become Boris Baths. <laughs> and we had Boris bikes, and then we had Boris Baths. Uh, yeah, I think that would have been pretty bleak. Yeah, <laughs> given um, <laughs> we've seen the man's true colours now. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed talking to, to the GLA, to Mayor's office, just to, mm. to update them to where we're going, and hopefully. Um, when we get to the right stage, we can talk properly about um, their involvement or or not. You know. And so, how do you how do you go about raising seed capital? What kind of people are you looking to? Um, we're looking for um, large swimming companies. We're, we're right. in, in conversation with with uh, one of them from from Kickstarter days, Speedo, who help provide the swim caps. So we're talking with them. Um, we're we're open to anyone really who's interested in sport, community sport in particular. Yep. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I guess the Baths crosses over so many, so many um, topics, so many areas in terms of um, urban design as well as health and well-being, yeah. sport. Um, uh, you know, you, you name it. We can, in a sense, if we get the get the Baths big enough, um, they can have community facilities on board. We can have cafe, a restaurant. Um, you know, the pools become become one entity of it. Um, so. I guess uh, what's been really exciting is that people we meet or people we approach to talk about it, we can very quickly steer the baths to being core to what they're thinking about. Yeah. Um, I think talking to Speedo has been, been great because we're very aligned with the same sort of ethos uh, about community involvement, getting mm. people to water, um, and, and the programming of the baths are going to be absolutely key so you know, it doesn't sit idle. A lot of the Lidos, unfortunately, are just not programmed out during the day right. so you know wednesday in, in in october wednesday afternoon in october it'll just be general swimming well i mean that's not going to get punters through the door so yeah. you know we would have quite organized uh program of events during the week mm. uh, and particularly during the holidays to get kids in there different ages different groups in there um and i think that will make it a different place to perhaps some of the lidos we see at the moment in london brilliant no, very, very exciting. And so has this kind of idea of like, you know, taking an idea, being your own client, has that kind of, are there any other projects that you're kind of you're seeing um, that could change the way that you practice rather than the sort of traditional model of getting clients and... I, I, yeah, I mean, I'd love to, love to, I'd love to say we have multiple uh, projects like that, but I fear we wouldn't be necessarily in business. Um, it, it is an incredible draw on the business. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's through all our other projects that we've been able to keep the Thames Bath um, afloat. Ha ha. <laughs> um, and uh, so I think if we were looking for multiple other projects of that type, I think mm. we, you, you know you, you would have to be very canny about it. That said. We have had uh, and are working on a lot of inquiries who have come through their, the interest in Thames Baths. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're potentially about to do some work on floating homes. Right, okay. Um, uh, a kind of wellness center, a wellness garden floating again. Um, a floating kennel, which 
is a, a curious one. Interesting. Uh, um, so lots of different things, which all of which are clients, which um, some of which have money or are looking for money, which we've been able to use our skills and contacts, particularly around the river and the authorities connected with it, yeah. to to help the projects develop and progress. So. Um, I think the long answer to what you're saying is yes, we will. And yes, we have changed the way we operate. Mm. Um, and I think that we chase uh, people we enjoy the work of or uh, uh, who, who, who's doing interesting things. Uh, we get in touch with them and say, you know, what can we do? Can we help? Can we do anything? Yeah. And I think beforehand we perhaps didn't do that just out of, you know, um, being slightly reserved and British about things. Can yeah. Kind of wait for people to come to your door or not go knock on their door um which is which is c continues to to open up different avenues mm. um well, this is this is the thing i was, speak, to, speak to a lot of architects is you know there's there's a, a often a lack of like kind of being the proactive one mm. to go out and meet a client or find find work yeah yeah no, i mean I, I i love doing it as well i mean mm. it's good. some people don't enjoy doing it um but actually i i um, prefer to be doing that than drawing uh, uh, you know brick wall detail i, I that doesn't really do it for me. Uh, so I, I prefer to be be out there meeting people and seeing, yeah. trying to join join dots, I guess. Um, and, and was that something that's kind of always been quite natural to you, or? Yeah, I think it, I think it has. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love you know, obviously we love design and I love architecture and sitting in the, in the studio and resolving issues and problems. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I've always enjoyed getting out there and meeting people as well, um, and. Um, yeah, I I, th I think that that'll never go away. Whereas mm. James, on the other hand, just l you know, it's not that he doesn't like meeting people; he's not a hermit, mm. but uh, he he obsesses about the detail. Yeah, and we'll sit drawing um, nuts and bolts at one to one until um, you know, till the end of time. But well, that's that's quite interesting as well. Actually, the kind of complementary skill sets. Mm. And was that something that you guys were aware of when you set up practice that you were kind of outgoing, networking, and that James was. No, or, or I mean, was it? Or it just sort of transpired that way? No, no, it, it is a good question because we we we, we don't we didn't realise that at all. We didn't think about that at all, mm. uh, and it wasn't until um, probably about five or six years in that we had a uh, an absolutely superb business manager advisor, yeah, um, who said to us, um, "You really need to." She she basically drew out of us what we both enjoyed doing which surprise, surprise, turned out to be our skills. Right. Uh, and then said to us, why Why do you punish each other by making you do, <laughs> you know, what, Chris, you don't want to, or at slash you can't, mm. draw nuts and bolts at one-to-one. -one. James, you know, you're happy meeting people, but your skills are... So was this, was this an external consultant that you hired? Yeah, it or? was, yeah. It was actually a friend of a friend who'd done work for um, Zaha and Amanda Levite. Right. Uh, and... Um, so it was a really good contact. Yeah. Um, she's since retired, sadly. Um, but she really um, uh, she opened her eyes to actually trying to operate in a, yeah. in, a, in a smoother way as opposed to wrestling and fighting every day uh, with why I can't do this, James, how do I do this? And he's like, well, why don't you know, just focus on what you're good at? Mm. And that suddenly the thing started to move forward at greater momentum. Yes. Yeah. Um, which was a hugely valuable piece of advice because... It unlocked a whole load of issues. Yeah, uh, and a whole load of freedom for you guys to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were just able to run off with, with these things which we enjoyed doing mm. <laughs> uh, as opposed to feeling like we should share them or, uh, yeah. or do some other tedious stuff we didn't enjoy doing. Yeah. No, that's, that's often, often quite an interesting uh, thing to look at is that the partnerships and how mm. if you don't get that right or like you say that like you don't realize you don't you're not you're not doing what you're both good at and you're kind of squabbling over it is it's kind of causes conflict yes yes i i think uh i mean amazingly james and i we've never i don't think we've really ever entered into uh, conflict zones yeah um but it felt like we were we were we were driving with you know with a brake on two wheels um and it's just like why do we you know and then i took it off the brake and we were we were free flowing and yeah. it, it just felt much better um so yeah i think uh, looking for business partners who are complementary is absolutely key when you're starting out yeah uh, and i'd like to say i thought about that but i didn't <laughs> <laughs> i don't think james did either but and so what's the what's the future for studio octopi um the future is uh continuing to to evolve uh all the different sectors which we work in yeah um 
uh, I don't necessarily think that makes amazing business sense mm. in the sense of where's your specialisms uh, other than it's hugely enjoyable mm. uh, um, well this is this is an interesting kind of dilemma that many architects face is yeah. that from a marketing perspective mm. the you know the the niche market is the kind of the desirable yeah. to find you know but also as an architect practicing how do you balance those specialisms with the the enjoyment and the fulfillment of yeah, working yeah. on a variety of projects yeah i mean i think i think yes obviously the numbers have all got to add up and we've got to make, yeah. make money and 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 uh, not have to work in a bar at night and whatever <laughs> uh we've never got to that stage but um i for me anyway and james may tell me otherwise uh but uh it's always been about enjoying ourselves because as soon as you start having a miserable dreading going into work you know yeah. we we you know i had years of dreading going into work and being told to draw up the detail for something which i just had no idea frankly any interest in drawing anyway i uh <laughs> i i just thought i did whatever happens in my practice i'm not going to do that yeah. um and you know to a certain extent uh, and i'm sure plenty of employees would tell me otherwise but i i like to think that employees who we have we've let them run with things they enjoy mm. it doesn't mean you can only do the things you can enjoy uh but I if you're good at something step forward and let's let's run with it let's have a go yeah um and i think that's really important um and i and i don't think that again going sort of back to education i don't think that at at college at university one is taught to a be entrepreneurial yeah to enjoy it um we're terribly bogged down in what we do uh, and that may mean bogged down in only thinking the whole world's about design or yeah, only yeah. thinking it's all about you know light falling onto a surface which <laughs> I was many years in, at plymouth university just baffled why we were learning about how much light came through a clear story into a into a white box classroom you know you've got consultants to do that why you don't need to yeah. know how much light falls on a surface uh, well, it's it's fascinating that particularly in architectural education now that it, it becomes more and more refined, um, you know, uh, inquiries that go on that are really, really sort of academic, conceptual, spec fascinating. Mm. I'm not, I don't want to take mm. away from mm. the value of that, but it's there's it what what it does is when you actually come out into practice is it makes a more of an extreme gulf between yeah. actually what a client is interested in. Yeah. And what somebody who's going to be paying for your services mm. wants and expects from us yeah. as architects, yeah, yeah. and then what we're interested in, what we want to deliver on, yeah, and, yeah, and that can yeah. be a kind of. I mean, if that I think if that was addressed at university, at in the education of an architect from the outset, is mm. that we're always dealing with other people, and that there's a co it's a conversation. Or architecture yeah. is a conversation. It's a relationship. Yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree, and uh, you know, I'd love to. Um, I'd love to have the time, but maybe maybe one day we'll, we'll be able to create the time. But I'd love to have the time, uh, especially when we delivered Thames Bath, which I think mm. will make the story sweeter to talk about how we managed to get from a, an open call idea yeah. to a completed baths. Uh, if we don't complete the baths, then then all our other projects which have opened up from that whole um, journey. And that journey's only happened because we've been pushing it. We haven't been we haven't been lucky, and all our things have fallen into place. Yeah, you know we've been pushing it bloody hard. Yeah, uh, and um, so you, you you can teach people entrepreneurialism, but uh, ultimately they're going to have to step out of their comfort zone and yeah. push it incredibly hard. Um, but the rewards are there. You, you know, sitting back and assuming that the client is just going to say, "Build me a house," and then walk away and let you get on with it, is a, is a dream world. And unfortunately, as you say, a lot of the universities still teach uh, in a very narrow way yeah um so it's left to practice to teach people that actually know yeah. it's a dialogue um so yeah. brilliant excellent thank you very much very inspiring Not story <laughs> thank you so much for your time okay thanks Cheers. very much Bye. Bye. so that is a wrap thank you for listening Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the award-winning platform that combines time and expense tracking, billing, project management, accounting, and business intelligence. Make work easy with Core. You can get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.co.uk forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.